and welcome everyone to today's Synergist webinar, FRAR Clothing, a town hall on heat stress, cold stress, and more. I'm Ed Rakowski, Editor-in-Chief of the Synergist, the magazine of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. I'd like to thank all of our attendees for participating, and especially our sponsor, Bulwark Protective Apparel. Today's presentation was built directly from questions submitted by users of FRAR Clothing. This webinar will be presented in a question and answer format, but we're going to try to reserve some time at the end of the hour for any new questions our audience may have. Our presenter today, Derek Fang, has been involved with the flame-resistant clothing industry in a variety of roles for over 20 years. Derek has developed and conducted over 250 educational and informational seminars on the hazards of arc flash and flash fire. In his current position as a technical training manager, Derek has developed over 40 hours of training curriculum for a Bulwark University. These training efforts cover all aspects of FR clothing, assisting companies in how to properly design and implement an FR clothing program, and complying with OSHA's training requirements for PPE. Derek is a recognized subject matter expert, a qualified safety sales professional, a certified environmental health and safety professional, a certified safety health and environmental technician, and recently became a qualified trainer for low voltage based on NFPA 70E. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Derek. Ed, thank you for that kind introduction and uh, thanks to AIHA for having us today. Uh, I'm in the process here of sharing my screen with you all, and that is the least of my expertise, is uh, definitely on the computer side. So hopefully everybody can see the first slide, which should read, Ask the Expert, or in this case, particularly the FR Expert, because that's about what we're going to focus on today. And as Ed said, we're going to focus on the Q&A format, and so we'll take one of the questions that we get, and then we'll provide you the answer. And as Ed alluded to, we'll reserve about 10 or so minutes at the end for some of those questions that are on your mind that we don't happen to get to. So with that being said, let's get the attorneys out of the way. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for conducting their own hazard risk assessment to identify safety hazards in their work environment. Customers of Bulwark Protection are solely responsible for selecting the appropriate garments and protective gear for their employees and ensuring wearers use the garments and protective gear properly and in conjunction with appropriate gloves and footwear. Because working conditions and other factors may vary, Bulwark Protection does not make any representation that these garments and protective gear will protect wearers from injury. So on to the good stuff. So welcome to the town hall format. Uh, really kind of neat idea because we get a lot of questions in and around flame resistant and arc rated clothing all the time and in many of our subject matter specific uh, webinars we don't get to deal with some of these kind of offshoots that happen so we're going to do our best to get into some of the interesting ones today uh, so some definitions right off the bat. We use tons of acronyms, and I apologize. Some of them roll off the tongue without us thinking about to provide the, the definition. So here are some quick definitions for what we're talking about today. FRAR, flame-resistant arc-rated garments. The reason that the FR first is because all arc-rated garments are first and foremost flame-resistant, not all Flame-resistant garments go through additional testing to be arc-rated. What is the definition of flame-resistant when we're talking about garments? They self-extinguish. They do not support com uh, combustion, and they do not melt, drip, or add to the injury once that ignition source has been removed. Arc-rated, as I mentioned earlier, these are additional tests that are conducted on flame-resistant fabrics to see if they can be protective in an arc flash. And then if we talk a little bit about CP, chemical protection, when we talk about it within the context of bulwark protection and bulwark protective garments, we are referring to bulwark FRCMP, which would be flame resistant chemical protection, and chemical protection garments. These are just resmell small amounts of inadvertent liquid splashes at atmospheric pressures. We're not talking about chem suits. We're not talking about barriers here. So flame-resistant garments protect those who are exposed to accidental thermal hazards, and it's secondary PPE. And where do we see these hazards? 
as mentioned, arc flash hazard. That is our general industry electricians, and that's our utility electricians. Uh, flash fire hazards, where do we see those? That is our oil and gas exploration, refinery, and in our chemical uh, markets. Molten metal splash, don't talk a lot about that because one, it's a small community within a small community. It primarily focuses on steel and aluminum here in the U.S. And there's not a lot of it, and the solutions are relatively simple. Heavy weight FR cottons for steel and Oasis or Vinex for molten aluminum splash. And then the one that's kind of emerging that is kind of hits on a lot of these is combustible dust hazards. Uh, combustible dust hazards are chain reaction explosive fire flash fires, which in and of themselves are unique and the PPE requirements are somewhat unique, but they directly correlate to flash fires. So let's get started into the Q&A. Everyone talks about heat stress, but what do we do when it's cold stress? And here we are in the middle of summer going to address a cold stress question because believe it or not, it's right around the corner. And when I say summer, I'm based in Arizona, it's 105 degrees here right now. So let's talk about some cold stress. So what is the difference between or what is uh, cold stress from a FR standpoint and how should we look at it? First and foremost, whether they're cool temperatures, hot temperatures, when we start stressing our systems, when, we, when our body struggles to regulate body temperature, stay at that 98 point degrees, we are in stress, whether it's caused by heat or whether it's caused, caused by cold. When it comes to cold in particular, unlike heat, we're talking primarily about insulation. We are talking about having to layer up. We're talking about having a base layer. Then we're talking about having a mid layer. Then obviously an outer layer. And within that outer layer, you want to have, if not waterproof properties, you want to have durable water resistance there because one of the big multipliers for cold stress is getting wet and wind. So we want to block wind and we want to stop from getting wet. But then the challenge is, is when we're working and ex ex exerting ourselves, now we're perspiring. And when we have perspiration under cold conditions, that's counterproductive also. Then we factor into all that, we have an arc flash or a flash fire hazard. So we're protecting ourselves against arc flash and flash fire. Now we're protecting yourself. The environmental conditions are also a, a stressor. So what do we do there? There's a number of things we can do with the caveat being that all those layers, if they constitute or they're made up with garments that have flame resistant properties that can be equal to or greater than the task at hand, they can provide that flash fire or that arc flash protection in and of themselves, then we can manipulate our layering apparatus when it's really cold in the morning and we're working on, on site. If we're in that bucket as a utility guy, as it heats up and as our work level increases, we can doff that outermost layer as long as the next layer underneath is equal to or greater than the hazard. We can work our way down to our most base layer, again, as long as it's equal to or greater than the hazard it's facing. And then as we decrease work or it starts to get cooler or the environment, we now start to encounter some uh, moisture, precipitation, we can layer back up. We can do all these things while managing ourselves within that environment. So again, what we want to take away from this basic question is, we can work and manipulate as the environment changes if our layers have those flame resistant arc rated properties that are identified and each layer is equal to or greater than the hazard uh, in front of us. The downside becomes when we mix and match non-FR and FRAR layers. If we go from our outer layer is a flame-resistant arc-rated brown duck coat, then our next layer is a 100% cotton 
non-FR sweatshirt, and then the layer under that is something different than our base layer is such and such, we can really then limit our options of working in that cold, and now the environment starts to become a major stressor. So the key is, if this is your condition, if cold stress as we go into the winter months is high on your list, get with those folks that can work with uh, these combinations and provide some guidance so that you're not jeopardizing or increasing a hazard by trying to uh, manage the cold environment. So now we switch to discuss heat stress garments, including those that could be worn under flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, aka heat stress and layering. What does that mean? Well, typically now we're, we're, we're flipping the coin. We just went from where the layers are important because that insulative uh, component is key to managing our cold stress. What do we want to or how can we manage the hot environment, typically when you're dealing with no more than two layers? In a lot of cases, just one layer. Obviously, we want to manage it in having that our clothing is key and, and lightweight. We want to have an open weave construction so that the majority of air can pass through there. We can get some convection. So lightweight works on the radiation. Okay, It allows more heat to be released. So radiation is a prime mover of heat off our body, so that stays effective. Convection, we want air to pass through there and get that swamp cooler little effect going. And the more air that moves through, keep our nose cool and dry. And then moisture wicking. The more effective we can be transferring moisture from our skin to the surface where it can be evaporated, the more effective uh, that system is. As we sit today, one of the strongest motivators within uh, the flame-resistant arc-rated garment manufacturing community is to manage these three components when it comes to heat. Believe me, we understand and we hear all the time that garments are hot and uncomfortable. As we manipulate these three options within fiber, choosing the right fibers, constructing an open weave in the garment, creating uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic fiber combinations where we can move moisture, we can evaporate moisture, these are the key ingredients within the marketplace today. And when we look at garments made of fabrics that are being produced and are out in the market today and in the last probably 12 months, and you compare them to where we were in the 80s and 90s, it literally is night and day. And if you are utilizing fabrics that their heyday was 1995, take the opportunity to explore some of the newer, lighter weight fabrics that are out there. And this segues right into, could you discuss options for light FR clothing? Absolutely. There's a couple of key considerations. We've already went over moisture whipping, high air permeability, moisture vapor transfer, and those are all things that can be manipulated by uh, fabric design, fabric weave, fiber choice. All those things can be manipulated. The key things when we are considering and evaluating these concepts is one, each and every single one of these in and of themselves is not an indicator of comfort. If I, had, if I hand you something that's light, light in weight, does not necessarily make it comfortable. If it's fully synthetic, if it, doesn't, if it has a very tight weave and it has no moisture wicking capabilities, it's not going to be comfortable. Think in the back of your mind. Think of polyester in the 1970s. Think of polyester in the early 80s. If we were to tell you that the number one fiber for athletic performance gear in 2015 was 100% polyester, and you would think that you would go, no way. When you look at our top flight athletic performance gear today, it's 100% synthetic. When you look or if you think back to whatever sport you may have participated in, whatever activity you had in the, in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, and someone told you you'd be wearing polyester 20 years from now, 25 years from now, 
you'd probably have a chuckle because it was so far from even being uh, a reality, and here we are today. So just remember, lightweight in and of itself, not an indicator of comfort. Uh, being able to move air rapidly and easily, not an indicator of comfort. You Look at a screen door. Look at, look at what uh, huge air permeability, lightweight. I definitely want to, want, want to make a shirt out of uh, what goes into making a screen door. So if you think about all these things, it's a balance. It's talk about everything coming in with the right uh, fiber design, fiber properties, weaving that into uh, the right construction so you have an open weave, and then looking at having uh, moisture wicking capabilities built into the actual fiber, and then you have moisture vapor transfer, which gives you lightweight and comfortable. And in what we do, remember, First and foremost, it needs to protect you to the hazard. It has to uh, exceed any of the standards for your hazard, whether that's ASTM 1506 for arc flash, whether that's NFPA 2112 for flash fire. If we don't do those things, all the rest of this is irrelevant. So as we look to what are breathable options, again, here we are sitting in, in the summer months, and you can argue depending on where you are in, in the U.S., Canada, or the world, how hot it is uh, today as versus a year ago, five years, ten years ago. We are all trying to find ways to still stay cooler. We're all trying to find ways to push off uh, heat stress type symptoms. Understand in the overall concept when we're looking at heat management, heat stress management, single layer fabrics fall pretty far down the list. Understand we're looking at rest hydration, shade, staying cool, and as you work your way down the list, once you get past metal conditions and, and other reasons, now we can look at single layer fabrics and how they factor into contributing to, and, and it's relatively low. Uh, NIOSH, CDC, and all the other studies have shown that single layer fabrics, whether they have FR properties or not, are pretty low contributors overall. But that being said, the perception is, as a wearer, I want to feel as comfortable as I possibly can. So as you're evaluating flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, take a look at what's available today, look at how it protects, then how it's constructed, moisture wicking, high air permeability, moisture vapor transfer. Make sure that those are built in, make sure they're not a, a treatment or a wicking, uh, excuse me, not like a wicking treatment that's temporary. Most of the uh, additives for things like wicking and that are only going to last 25, 30, 40 washings. Make sure it's built into the fabric. Make sure it's built into the fiber. Make sure it's something that's going to be permanent and last the life of that uh, garment. Switching gears. Uh, as we go in and out of uh, vector-borne disease season, depending on where you are located, uh, Early spring starts it, usually late fall ends it. When you are looking at flame-resistant arc-rated clothing or flame-resistant clothing in general, it is a challenge uh, when it comes to protecting yourself against vector-borne diseases from mosquitoes, ticks, etc. The most common and easily available uh, to do that is DEET. Unfortunately, DEET has a very, very uh, low flash point. It's about 300, between 300 and 400 degrees. Unfortunately, your hazard in an arc flash, you're 8 to 10,000 degrees outside of that equipment. In a flash fire, you're anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 degrees uh, for a couple, three seconds. You're going to reach the flash point of what you're putting on your clothing, and it's going to flare up. That's the bottom line. You're putting an accelerant onto your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. We don't want to do that. Uh, so what are your options? Uh, if products containing DEET cannot be sprayed on my clothes, what can I do? Uh, you can spray it on undergarments, put your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing over top of that. Play it, spray it on your skin underneath, and then put your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing on top of that. That's what the DEET folks will tell you. Uh, there's other options. There's permethrin-based options, uh, which have uh, been around for a while. A large majority of manufacturers uh, 
don't have a problem with the commercially available permethrin based products today. There's a couple of places that you can look for those. Uh, there's a product that went through Incident Prevention Magazine on an arc flash side of it called, I believe it's Buzz Off. Uh, Ben's uh, Clothing and Gear from Tender. Uh, Rainbow, uh, I believe, even has another option. And I believe there's a CRC option. All of these, the technologies are very similar. Uh, they're looking to be clothing safe. Uh, the only one that's safe on skin that I'm aware of, uh, as I've seen them, is the Buzz Off product. That's good uh, both on skin and uh, clothing. So make sure that you work with those manufacturers. There are options. You have to determine, uh, based on the supplier, what and how you're going to utilize that and make sure you train your people on how to properly apply that. Uh, in those particular cases. So stay away from DEET. There are some options out there. You need to do some research. Do the fibers with the added fire retardant have the potential uh, to be absorbed by the skin of the wearer? Assuming the fabric is not used until the fibers have been cured, does the fire retardant have the potential to be absorbed by my skin? So what we're looking at here is not... Uh, Synthetic-based flame-resistant technologies, we're not looking at FR motor acrylics, we're not looking at Nomex's, Kermel's, and the others uh, within this space. Primarily, what they're asking here is when you take a cellulosic like cotton, which is a fuel, and you apply flame-resistant engineering at the fabric level, what does that chemistry do to me, the wear? What you have to look first and foremost is to proven products. Look to uh, fabrics that have a legacy of performance in this marketplace. Uh, if you look at the fabrics that we utilize here in the U.S., you look at uh, Westex, uh, Endura, Endura Ultrasoft, you look at Mount Vernon Mills, you look at uh, cotton-rich fabrics produced by these proven uh, supply chain partners, this is not an issue. Is it not an issue worldwide? I can't answer that because it is a complex pro process to take a fuel and basically impart FR engineering into it so that it bonds with that fiber and never weakens through the life of it and hence never comes in contact with you. So First and foremost, legacy of proven uh, track record, 25, a quarter plus century now uh, here in the U.S., great products, but you've got to make sure that you're utilizing market proven products when you're looking into these types of technologies. And that's across the board. Are inherent garments better than treated garments? And the simple answer is in today's world, as you're looking for proven uh, market performance, the simple answer is no. The other thing you've got to look at is the terms in and of themselves, are they even relevant in describing where the market is today? You had inherent garments, uh, which would be your synthetics, that would be engineered at the molecular level or the fiber level. You're looking at uh, traditional names such as Nomex, Kermel, uh, Kevlar. You're looking at FR mode acrylics, FR rayons. They've had their FR engineering imparted to them at the molecular level by changing the molecular fo formula they were engineered, or at the fiber level, we, we added fire retardant chemistry into that soup before it was extruded, and now you have a fiber that previously didn't have flame-resistant properties. It now does. And then we treated cotton or fuel to impart flame-resistant engineering at the f a fabric level. So which is better, which is uh, more prevalent? It's irrelevant today. Why? Because all the blends today utilize one or three of those technologies. We either are engineering at the molecular level, the fiber level, or the fabric level, and they are blended together. They have become the point to where it's hard to separate. So what are the definitions? The best definition that I can give you is FR engineering because they're all engineered at one of those levels and what should matter is, is that engineering for the life of that garment. 
is that engineering good day one, day 1001, and more importantly, the day you need it. And that is really uh, when you're looking to specify and you're evaluating these garments, that's really what you want to look at. What is the guarantee? Is it guaranteed just to meet the standards, or is it guaranteed far beyond that? And that'll give you an indication. The question that the next question that comes up about wearing compliance, uh, in this case, they called out bulwark FR shirt as a base layer. So I've got my work shirt on, tucked into my pants. I put a cotton hoodie over that, and then I have my compliant FR jacket, my brown duck, my twill jacket over top of my cotton hoodie, and I've got my FR cotton shirt underneath that. That's a common practice at this facility, and they were looking for some clarification. Is that considered a best practice? That brings into uh, a couple of comments. Uh, one, if that uh, hoodie is ever outside of that jacket, now it's the outermost layer, and what do our regulations and standards all say? The outermost layer has to be flame resistant, arc rated equal to or greater than that hazard. The second that hood drops over the back of my jacket, it's now the outermost layer, and if it's non-FR, I'm not in compliance. Also, what happens through excessive movement? Or even if I were to zip that jacket down because I'm starting to heat up through the day, remember going back to the first slide, we talked about uh, cold stress. As I'm warming up, I unzip my jacket a little bit. Now that 100% cotton non-FR hoodie is my outermost layer, and it's not FR. So again, we're not compliant. There's an inherent weakness when you go from a FRAR layer, a non-FR layer, to another FRAR layer. You have injected a weak link into your program. And it unnecessarily puts that program in jeopardy. Think about this company. This company is invested in the proper FR arc-rated pants, the proper FR arc-rated work shirt, the proper FR arc rated outer garment, and they're allowing a underlayer of 100% cotton, or as we like to refer it to, 100% fuel. You have taken all that investment and you've put it under into jeopardy. The only way to mitigate this particular challenge is to make sure all those layers have flame resistant properties. So I would answer that question directly as. Uh, no, I would cease and desist that habit, and I would make sure if they're going to have hoodies, that those hoodies have flame-resistant arc-rated properties to the, to, the, uh, to the hazard. We always get on uh, training, especially in NFPA 70E. Uh, what is the required training session for each qualified person? Because the only people that can be in that arc flash boundary are qualified people. I can have an unqualified person assisting me if I have escorted them in, plus we're all in the appropriate PPE. But in order to be qualified, what is uh, the amount of training? Where does that training come from? Well, first and foremost, the only person that can dictate whether someone is qualified is the employer. Uh, there's no certificate that I can go and get. There is no course that I can go and achieve. The one qualifying me for my facility is my employer. Uh, so what does 70E or OSHA basically say as they do not designate a time allotment for that? Basically, uh, what they see is the time needs, the training needs to meet the, the requirements of the audience. If you have a highly trained electrical staff, it may be a matter of, you know, one day, a two day. If you have media, it might be a five day, it might be a month. Uh, what they're saying here is they're not going to dictate what is going to be qualified. The qualifications or the training to meet qualification is, has to meet the needs of the audience, and you may find that that, that varies. You may have to have a half-day course, a full-day course, a full-week course. The point is if a worker or a, an electrician gets hurt by electricity, they weren't following safety-related work practices. If I encounter an injury that's not a fatality in and around electricity, they're going to say that happened because I was not trained properly. 
So the employer has to provide enough training to prevent this. How much training, again, the employer can decide. You can uh, consult and uh, get some recommendations. There's some great electrical training folks out there. Uh, E-Hazard with Hugh Hoagland, AVO, uh, Llewellyn's Electrical Training, Seams. There's lots of places you can get and consult and make sure that this training is done. But again, in, for this particular question, there is no mandated uh, approved length of time. When it comes to flame-resistant arc-rated clothing, what on top is doing all the work? It has to be equal to or greater to the incident de energy, or your layered combination has to be equal to or greater than the incident energy that you are facing. That all being said, your undergarments still come into play. Remember, all, we are self all we're doing is self-extinguishing once the ignition source is gone. All that IR, all that heat, all that energy is still passing through me. We are not blocking all that. That seven ounce shirt and the nine ounce denim is not going to, your undergarments are going to come into play. That's why we don't allow certain things underneath. We don't allow meldables. We want to stick to natural fibers. We want them to be cotton, wool, or sick or silk. Why? Because under thermal events, if they are protected, if there is no break open and none of that arc or energy is getting through, they will not melt, drip, and add to the injury. That's great. Do we stop there? No. Why? Because we have a segment of our employees that may have challenges that we have to be aware of. Women's undergarments, it's very, very difficult to find 100% cotton, wool, slick, or silk undergarments that are going to provide any kind of support where needed. But understand all those items that may or may not supply support in that garment, wire layers, spandex, lycra, all those things, you're introducing something that's going to heat up very quickly and also introduce something that's going to melt and cause injury. So make sure that you're providing resources for your uh, female employees to where they can source Nomex, FR Mode Acrylic, uh, sport bra style options. There are companies out there that, that do that, so make sure that we do not forget about a big segment of our workforce because they do have additional challenges when it comes to undergarments. Considering uh, continuing down this path of what challenges we have underneath our flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. We had a department that obviously hard work you're moving, you're injuring shoulders, knees, elbows, wrists. Uh, are there any concerns when it comes to synthetic uh, braces? Yes, there are. What things do we want to talk about? What things do we want to do in those cases? There are some references to small amounts of permitted elastic non-melting fabrics in underwear or socks. Does that help us with neoprene braces, cop uh, with, with compression garments, excuse me, compression uh, braces? Uh, not really, but it gives us an idea that, okay, we can work with this a little bit. Uh, we do know that we don't want them to melt, drip, or add to the injury. So one of the things we want to look to is look for medical-grade braces. Don't be going to CVS. Don't be hopping on to, you know, uh, Copperfit and, and, and Brett Favre and all these other promotions on these lightweight compression-style braces. I use them myself. I get hurt all the time, but I'm definitely not wearing them in an arc flash or a flash fire environment. Make sure these are medical grade. The neoprene is going to be thick enough that it's going to resist these short duration thermal events. And the other concept is, is what we want to do is we want to get a flame resistant base layer, make sure it's long sleeve, and make sure we're taking that brace and placing it over top of that base layer, and then we're donning our primary outer layer, which is going to be our, our, our work shirt, whatever that's made up for the hazard. But make sure we've got something underneath those braces for that a little bit of additional uh, peace of mind that these will not factor into any injury in these types of environments. So there are workarounds. 
make sure you get with some subject matter experts who have had some experience in talking about these that can at least consult you in that. If you need to get these type of things to where your workforce wants them uh, tested, there are some third-party folks out there that can work on putting these on mannequins and testing them. Typically what we see, especially in an arc flash environment, the durations are so short, as long as that outer layer doesn't break open, what's under it's, if it's medical grade and it's thick type neoprene, you're not going to see any melting, dripping, and adding to the injury, and that's what's going to be key. Are there FR arc rate concerns in relation to accessories like belts and or suspenders? I can, cannot come up with any decent literature discussing the topic. That's because there isn't a lot. Uh, when we look at accessories, primarily we're focusing on uh, leather belts and minimizing metal. Uh, we look and talk to, especially in our electrical community, we want to minimize anything that is conductive. Uh, we do have uh, what's deemed arc-rated belts. That means that they're leather. They have little or no metal. Some of them use that scratch, scratchless belt technology that's been around in the automotive industry for years to where there is no metal on, on the surface because that's going to heat up. We want to reduce those things. Leather is very resistant to thermal energy. That's why we allow heavyweight leather footwear. Uh, as long as dialectic footwear is not needed, heavyweight leather footwear is good. We see that in our arc flash community, our flash fire community. Leather protectors over our rubber gloves take a significant amount of injury, uh, ignition, excuse me, incident energy before we see any kind of damage, any kind of shrinkage along those things. They protect those leather, uh, those uh, rubber gloves very well. Suspenders with this in particular, I have not seen anything in and around suspenders. Now, there have been some folks who said, well, what about the fall harness ASTM F887 to where they are testing materials that are arc resistant. Arc resistant, not arc rated. Remember, you want to resist that arc, have enough integrity that I can still withstand the fall forces that I need to to protect and fall. That is completely different. I do not know how much ballistic nylon you would need to make an arc-resistant uh, suspender. I do not know how you would manage that, how you would test for it. So I'm currently not aware of anything from a suspender standpoint that would uh, be applicable here. Uh, employees. Uh, what do we have here? Employees are required to wear our safety reflective vests over our flame resistant arc rated clothing. How does this compromise affect the clothing and what can be a solution? Well, the easiest solution is first and foremost, make sure they are appropriate to the hazard. Make sure they have been tested and that those vests will not factor into any kind of injury. Uh, if you're familiar with the ANSI uh, 107, uh, 2015 standard, they went to great lengths to help folks uh, work through uh, the challenges with their safety vest. They, in fact, they gave us six standards in which uh, flame resistant uh, arc rated vests must meet in order to be utilized over top of flame resistant arc rated clothing. Uh, ASTM 1506 and uh, ASTM 1891 for our arc rated community, uh, NFPA 2113, uh, 2112 actually, uh, for and 2733, ASTM 2073 for our flash fires. Wildland is 1977, and the one that was not on this that's been recently brought back in is ASTM 2302, but it's not a standalone. It must have another standard in order for it to be applicable to your hazard. All that what you need to remember is within that label that you're looking at, it says ASTM 1506 and it has an arc rating. That means that vest has been tested to the arc flash hazard. NFPA 2112 will test tell you that it meets the flash fire hazard. Anything other than that, you should probably do a, at least additional investigation if it's a standalone standard like ASTM 6413 or it gives you some bogus 
explanation that these are self-extinguishing, they are self-extinguishing only in the very, very loosest interpretation of that, meaning it can take a little bit of welding slag and it might take a little bit of grinding slag, but it's not meant for arc flash and flash fire. So make sure you research uh, your vests and then if they meet the, the hazard, you're going to be fine putting them over top of your flame-resistant arc-rated clothing. Because remember, these are vests. They don't have any, typically are not fully sleeved. They don't have full enclosures. What's doing all the work is your flame-resistant arc-rated shirt for your particular hazard. All you want that vest to do is not factor into any additional injury or cause any additional uh, ignition, a.k.a. you want it to self-extinguish in that hazard. And the only way to know that is it has to have ASTM 1506 and an ARC rating for ARC flash and NFPA 2112 and the label for flash fire. In laboratory environments, what options are available for combining FR and chemical resistance? Well, here you have a, a laboratory where you have multiple hazards, and it's not unreasonable to think that I'm dealing with chemicals in that lab that when they react with air or other chemicals, I could have a thermal event. I could splash inadvertently some chemicals on me. If I have a 6535 or an 8020 lab coat, I am protected against neither of those hazards, even though those two hazards are prevalent in my work environment. So as I do my hazard assessment for my lab, we, uh, we deal with piranha solution, uh, we deal with uh, combustible items to, to air or water or we're dealing with lithium or any of those other nasty things. I want to have some flame resistant chemical protection built into uh, my lab coat. So What's a great fabric? Nomex 3A. There's your flame resistant uh, protection. Uh, chemical splash protection, there's great technology out there today provided by West Tex by Milligan called Shield uh, CXP technology. This is a treatment that goes on top of that Nomex 3A that lets it repel uh, certain chemicals. So there are solutions to uh, thermal and chemical in the laboratory if you've done your hazard assessment, then take that hazard assessment and equate it to the appropriate PPE that's out there. And again, get with subject matter experts that can help you watch, walk you through that because there are solutions. What types, of, uh, what types of statements would you expect to see in a manufacturer's guarantee? We always tell people that when you are specifying your flame-resistant arc-rated garments, whether it's rain gear, vests, jackets, shirts, pants, coveralls, get that guarantee and make sure that guarantee is in writing and is supported by the organization in which the guarantee is written for. And it has to be, has to be for the life of that garment. And what is a life of a garment? It is whatever the useful life of that garment is. And we all make that decision every single day. Why don't we have a timeline on this? Because I can wear a garment and I'm in a supervisory role and I sit on a, I sit on a stool in front of a control panel and because I work inside a refinery, it tells me I have to be wearing my flame resistant coverall 24 seven when I'm inside those gates and I pass a red button, green button, or a blue button, that's all I do every day. My coverall, I could wash it every week, and because it's under low stress, that could last me five, six, seven years. I could be a heavy-duty diesel mechanic in that same environment under different conditions. My garment can last me 18 months. Whether it's six, seven years or 18 months, you want those flame-resistant properties to be present the whole time. That's what the life of the garment means that those FR properties are not depending on how they're laundered, how they're manipulated, or how they go through their life cycle, and assuming that you have some relatively simple proper care and maintenance uh, things to do. So again, talking specifically to us, and because I can't talk to other people's guarantees, make sure it's in writing, make sure it's documented, make sure that it's everywhere that you can possibly see that that's guaranteed for life. 
The counter is guaranteed to, the, to meet the standard. Well, the laundry life on ASTM 1506 is it's tested at 25 laundrings. I'm sure that you're going to wear a garment post-25 laundering. So what happened to the guarantee? It's gone at 26. Even with NFPA 2112, which is 100 launderings, and arguably two to four years of wear life, depending on how you're processing it, whether you're doing it on a weekly basis at home or you're processing it within an industrial laundry, garments can, believe it or not, last more than two to four years. So what happens if... I have a garment that's in service for five years, and it's only guaranteed to meet the 2112 standard. You don't have a guarantee. Standards are minimums. Make sure that your garments are guaranteed well beyond that. Make sure they're guaranteed for exactly how long you're going to be using them. Uh, FR gloves and cut-resistant gloves, specialty FR. Not my expertise, so I've given a couple of links here. When you all are able to download this presentation, when you get the PDF, utilize these folks that are experts in gloves. There are cut-resistant, flame-resistant combinations out there. There's flame-resistant and there's arc-rated shock protect. There are gloves out there today to meet all your hazard. Again, the key is in that hazard assessment, then go out and find these experts that can help you match your hazards to your PPE, and they're doing a ton of great work in uh, hand protection when it comes to flame-resistant, arc-rated, cut protection. Uh, they're all doing good, and this is just a snapshot uh, of some of the ones that I've worked with uh, over the years. What do we know? Our visibility garments are still functional to meet visibility requirements. When I was asked this, I asked for some clarification only because there is high vis, there's ANSI, and there's enhanced vis. And this question was specific to ANSI and ANSI 107. And the truth is, uh, unless you're willing to go and do the chromaticity and the luminance test in the real world, most ANSI garments are out of compliance shortly after they're out of the box. Uh, dirt, grime, grease, oils, especially on those background colors, you're not going to pass the requirements in a relatively short period of time. You can do your best to uh, uh, manage dirt and soils, but most of these garments are in high uh, soil areas, and, and some of the care and maintenance, and, and I'm not telling people anything they don't know. When I take that vest off and I throw it in the back of my pickup or I toss it in the back of the work truck and it's exposed to the elements, that fluorescence and that photometric performance get compromised relatively quickly to the standard. Am I saying that they don't work? Am I saying that they will not provide the reflectivity at, at nighttime conditions or that fluorescence uh, background during daylight and low light hours will not factor into it? That's not what I'm saying. Specifically, when it comes to passing the standard and meeting the requirements of the standard, very, very difficult to do short time after uh, they're out of the box. Can you clarify if bulwark arc rated apparel is treated with chemicals to become arc rated? There's a rumor at my company that this clothing is tre treated with formaldehyde. And this will be my last question that I'll take here, and then I'm going to skip ahead to add, and we'll see if there's any questions that we didn't get to that would like to be asked. Because this is, it's not a tough one, but we get it quite often. Uh, there are very, very small amounts when we're talking about uh, FR fabrics that go through the ammonia cure process, when we talk about cotton-rich fabrics, uh, there are small traces of formaldehyde that occur in the manufacturing process, that occur in the binding, bonding process, and as these are taken up, uh, they do happen. Now, they are confined to the actual uh, fabric themselves. They're not free-floating in air. Uh, we talk all the time about our manufacturers who deal with us. We've had hundreds of thousands of wearers over the years. For the last 25-plus years, this technology has been uh, close to the leader in the market, if not the leader in the market when it comes to FR cotton-rich fabrics, and they have performed 
uh, our, our cut and sew folks in our facilities that we own in our particular uh, cases, the amounts per part per million are such on the low end, they're not even required to be uh, reported. We provide them on the SDS sheets uh, as a courtesy so that people know these. Uh, when we look at even being compliant with some of the more stringent states, when we look at Prop 65 and others, these are not reportable. So very, very low limits. Uh, when they first go through the initial launderings, the, the parts per million has dropped dramatically. And it's been a proven technology, like I said, for, for a lot of years. And uh, again, just being upfront and transparent about it, it is there. Is it something you should be concerned about on a regular basis? No, these are not free and open. It is something that is within the fabric itself, and it's not uh, airborne uh, from a wearer standpoint. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ed. Ed, if we have any additional questions, we've got a few minutes left. I'd be more than happy to take them. Great. Thanks, Derek, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we do have about 10 minutes uh, for questions. Just a reminder to our audience, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Um, we have one waiting from uh, Veronica, and she asks, is there a way to determine the summer or winter appropriateness of FRAR clothing via series or product line? And she says, I've noticed Bulwark FR clothing described as, quote unquote, lightweight, but you've indicated that that's not the best way to make a selection. Great question, uh, because we obviously have uh, some reference when we look at our retail world, especially when we get into uh, the, the REIs of the world, you get into the North Face products, you get into some of the other products, they do have specific lines. Uh, we do have concepts about cambered layering systems and things. We have not got, I would say, to that level of sophistication within our market. Uh, do I think it's something that's coming? I would say yes. Uh, where it's at, mm, that, that's arguable. Uh, but to Veronica's uh, question directly, what we always encourage when working with a manufacturer, whoever that may be, is take whatever you think and with ever their advice and wear test them. Uh, if you think there's something that is uh, applicable for a winter environment, summer environment, fall, whatever, get them on your people's backs at the appropriate time and, and, and take a 20-day a wear test. Take it for a test run. Any good, reasonable manufacturer will be more than happy to help you uh, work through a couple of options. And what I consider summer weight and what you consider summer weight may or may not be identical, but on our backs, that's sure the easiest way to tell. Great. Thanks, Derek. Um, Rebecca has a question specific to uh, welding. Um, she asks, which testing methodology is more stringent for welding PPE, NSPA 2112 or ASTM F? 1506. Great question. Uh, neither. Uh, we don't have a lot of standards applicable to uh, welding in the U.S. when it comes to PPE other than don't melt, no drip, 100% cotton. Non-FR cotton has been the, the mainstay for welding for years. And uh, again, what we've had numerous, numerous uh, examples of that that's not a good choice, especially when slag gets into creases, slag gets in, in to fold, and it's got time to sit there, and that heat can then uh, turn into ignition, and ignition can turn into combustion, and then we have a cotton fire on our welder, which is never good. Uh, we always encourage incorporating some flame-resistant properties into our welders, uh, shirts, pants, and coveralls, only to eliminate that. Uh, the tough thing for end users is it doesn't eliminate pinholes. Flame-resistant engineering does not mean that you will not damage garments, uh, because all that heat has to go somewhere. All we're stopping it from doing is turning into a uh, cotton fire 
on, on the where. Uh, always appropriate that we use our primary, whether we're using uh, our leather gauntlets, leather sleeves, uh, leather bibs. Uh, we need to make sure that from a training standpoint, we're utilizing the main protector, and that's going to be that, that leather apron, that leather gauntlet that, that for, from welding slag. Your shirts, pants, and coveralls are designed to be secondary, and we want to take ignition out there. So long-winded answer to say there are no strong regulations in uh, the welding community for shirts, pants, and coveralls other than they don't add to the injury, which once you reach the ignition point, they're definitely doing that. Uh, any good FR today, particularly your 8812s, your cotton-rich uh, nylon combinations, that nylon is going to help uh, shag, uh, excuse me, shed some of that ferrous metal. Uh, the 8812 FR component is going to stop that from uh, igniting, and both of those would meet 2112 and the ASTM 1506. Uh, standards for arcs. So they're going to be dual compliant and they'll be helpful for wetting. So cotton rich, a little bit of nylon in there, look for those types of products and that'll help your welder. Just remember in the back of your head it doesn't stop that shirt pant or coverall from getting damaged and what a lot of people look to is that's an $80 shirt versus a $40 non-FR cotton shirt. I'm just going to get you the $40 non-FR cotton shirt because there's nothing that says I have to get you that FR shirt. So just something to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, I think this will have to be the last question. This is from Michael, um, and he asks, do you have published clothing adjustment factors for determining heat stress for PPE? Great question, and uh, we have we have researched a couple of different things, things like clove factors, uh, other uh, test methodologies. There, there's a good uh, EN test that comes in, but most of these have been uh, – there's a, a sleeping bag test out there that some people have looked to try to correlate with clothing. We do see some factors, again, when you get into some of that specialty clothing for – mountain climbers, hikers, you'll hear of clove factors or cooling or heating factors, those things. The hard thing is when it comes to, uh, when we spend a lot of time talking about heat stress and cold stress, acclimation is the biggest factor. And one of the things that NIOSH and the CDC will tell you is acclimating workers and putting them in the environment has far more correlation to how they work in that area than the clothing even does. Think about it. If I just came from, if it's November and I was in Hawaii and I just came to Minnesota to do a job and I'm outside, I'm used to it being 85 degrees and I now came into zero to minus 10, how long is it going to take me to acclimate? I may be sitting got beside someone of the exact same build, the exact same metabolic rate, all these other variables that go into it, and I'm going to be freezing no matter how much clothing I've got on versus the guy from lifelong Minnesotan who's sitting in some hiking boots, some hiking pants, and a sweatshirt. And we're, so how much does that clove factor or those ratings tell me about how I'm going to or what I need for that em environment? So, again, it, it's not something uh, – that is easily uh, discerned. We always tell people, get your wear test done, get the clothes on the back that you're going to utilize, see how it works in there, acclimate your workers is the big thing that OSHA, NIOSH, and the CDC is telling us now when it comes to heat stress and cold stress, and look at that and stay, because some of them can be so misleading if – and I'm not doing a good job of communicating it here other than to say we don't use them because there's so many other factors that go into whether I'm comfortable or not in any particular environment than just how that clothing is rated for those fabric compositions, if that makes sense. Please email me if it doesn't. There's a ton more of this stuff that we go into when we talk about heat stress and cold stress for an hour as opposed to in a couple slides here. Uh, so feel free to contact me. Plus, I'll get your information. I get all these questions from the nice folks at AIHA, and if I haven't gotten to your question today, I'll definitely make uh, time to answer it and get back to you. 
Great. Thanks, Derek. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, I thank the Derek Sang for his presentation, to Bulwark for sponsoring today's webinar, and to all of our participants, please keep an eye on AIHA.webvent.tv for future Synergist webinars, and have a great rest of your day. All right. Thank you, everyone. This actually concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link. And please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.